Hi guys, Drew back again with Princess Craft RV and today we are going to walk through the appliances and accessories on the 2021 Soul Horizon by Intec. We're going to start right up front here as always with that loading and un unloading procedure. Uh, you are going to need a 2 and 5 16 inch ball to hook up to this camper. Uh, so once you equip your vehicle with that, it is just a matter of raising this jack three inches above your ball and drop. We're then going to our center ourselves underneath the coupler. We're going to uh, jack that down. Once fully seated on that ball, we're going to go ahead and take our slide latch, uh, moving that into the forward position, paying special attention that we do have both of these uh, tabs engaged there into the frame. Uh, now it's going to be our recommendation that you go back with a secondary pin and make sure that we go ahead and pin that latch in that lock position, keep that from potentially uh, rattling loose going down the road or anything like that. From there, we're going to go ahead and take our tow chains. Uh, we are going to cross those underneath the coupler and hook onto the receiver of the vehicle. Very important in the state of Texas that those are crossed underneath the coupler. And also we want to make sure that they are not going to make contact with the pavement at any time. So skate that fine line of having enough room to make your turns left or right, but not so much room that they may make contact with the pavement. Uh, riding right next to those tow chains on a separate connection point to the receiver is going to be your emergency breakaway cable. This is essentially your last line of defense if any of these other tow components were to become compromised. As the two vehicles separate, this is going to act like a ripcord to the electric brakes. Uh, essentially avoiding a runaway camper scenario. So we're going to, again, make sure that that is on a third or separate connection point on the receiver. Uh, also riding right next to all of that is going to be your seven-way plug here. This is going to plug into the corresponding receptacle on your vehicle. This is going to give you full function to your tow vehicle's charging system, uh, marker lights, tail lights, as well as your braking system. So kind of a lot going on with that. Uh, moving back here, uh, these soles have this nice propane cover. It's held on there with a couple of clips. So if we go ahead and remove those clips from each side and we pull that out of the way, we are going to find our dual propane containers or cylinders. Um, now these cylinders are 20 pound, 20 pound propane cylinders, uh, the same variant that you are going to find on any gas grill. Uh, open and close valve there on the top. Separating each tank or separating the tanks, we have a automatic switchover regulator in between the two. So the idea being is that whichever uh, direction this arrow is pointed or to whatever cylinder that that is pointed to, that's going to be our primary tank. It will draw off of that tank until it is empty and then left in this position. If both of these service valves are open, it's going to automatically switch over here to the secondary tank and start drawing off of that. Uh, now with that in mind, if we want to go ahead and, and remove our primary tank to have it serviced while we are drawing off of this secondary tank, all we need to do is go ahead and switch this over into that secondary position. That will allow that to kind of close off and the system will operate properly while we do get this tank serviced. Uh, not too terribly much going on here on uh, this side initially. We have a vent there for the battery. Uh, on the inside, we're going to find a Group 24 deep cycle battery. It is in a sealed battery box there underneath the dinette. And this is just a vent to allow that to vent to atmosphere. Uh, down below here, we have our sewage hose storage here. So just a, a little kind of secondary compartment that will house your sewage hose. Uh, that way you don't need to stow that uh, with any other, within any other compartment. Uh, right beside that, we have your dump valve here. Now, the gray and the black water here on these uh, Intex are uh, joined into one tank, so you don't have to worry about the separation of gray and black water. It's all going to go into the si same tank. Uh, with that being said, it is very important that we do keep this in the closed position. We're going to use the monitor panel on the inside, and we are only going to dump as necessary. So when it comes to hooking up your sewage hose, you are going to uh, rotate this cap in the counter counterclockwise position. Uh, if you take a look here, you have two keyholes on the cap as well as your sewage hose. So those are going to connect the very same way. You have four prongs along the outside here of your plumbing. You are just going to put that in the halfway position. And in this scenario, we're going to rotate it uh, clockwise until we're fully engaged there. Uh, hopping up here, we have your furnace vent. Uh, this is the exhaust for your propane burning furnace. 
Uh, very important that we do just that. We let it exhaust. We're not going to want to restrict that airflow, make sure we're not putting anything up against it. It does blow very hot air when it is on. Uh, now with not only the furnace here, but all of your propane and burning appliances, it's very important that we do protect them from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects. Uh, you will do so in this specific scenario by using the aftermarket bug screens. Uh, they're going to be held on there with a couple spring clamps, uh, keep everything nice and secure, keep those bugs from uh, nesting within the appliance. Uh, now up top here we have the uh, backside of your refrigerator. We have refrigerator vents both top and bottom. Uh, now the manufacturer was nice enough to go ahead and screen these from the uh, factory, which is awesome. That is going to keep those mud daubers and flying insects from the compartment. Uh, my recommendation is go ahead and remove this vent a couple times a year. Uh, make sure that nothing has been able to sneak past those. Make sure visually everything looks good. You're not seeing any uh, loose propane lines or frayed wires or anything like that. So just give it a visual inspection a couple times a year. Uh, now these vents, they get locked on kind of slightly different than you've probably seen before. Uh, we have some keepers here on the right side. Uh, so we're going to make sure that we seat those first. And with those fully seated, I kind of like to push it in with my hand here. Uh, we have two prongs that are going to uh, transition through the vent itself and then just two locking tabs that will slide down and hold that on. Now I always go back and give it a secondary pull here. Uh, make sure it is in fact locked on. You don't want to make, you don't want to lose these going down the road. Uh, moving on here, we have your tires. Now it's important to talk about tire pressure and lug nuts. Uh, the tire pressure on these units are, or on these particular tires are going to be uh, 50 PSI. That's the max tire pressure rating. You're not only going to find here on the sidewall of the tire, but you're also going to find that on the data tag that is uh, on the frame uh, at the front of the camper. Now, uh, with any camper tire, you run them at the max, uh, and that's what we're gonna do here, and again, that's 50 PSI. Uh, also important to talk about is going to be your lug nut torque. Uh, these lug nuts have been torqued to 100 foot-pounds here in the shop. Manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure, which is outlined here on this sticker, and that is the first 10, 25 and 50 miles of travel. It's very important that we do check and make sure that those lug nuts are maintaining their torque. Uh, manufacturer further recommends that at the start of each trip there on after, we are again making sure they are maintaining their torque. If we remove those wheels uh, for any sort of service or to change a tire or whatever, again, that 10, 25 and 50 miles is gonna start over. So make sure that we are uh, taking care of that. We have our 30 amp, 110 volt power supply here. Uh, now this only plugs into the camper one way. If we go ahead and take a look here, we have two uh, slotted receptacles in one L shaped. If we match those up with the corresponding prongs here on the camper and plug straight in, uh, shouldn't encounter any problems. We'll give it an eighth inch turn to the right that locks it in. Then we do have a secondary collar here. We're gonna screw down, lock in, uh, make things nice and secure. Now my number one recommendation I make for every single unit that we deliver is going to be adding a 30 amp surge protector here in line. Uh, with all of the sensitive electronics that we have within the unit, that is truly the number one way, uh, or really the only way you can protect that from substandard wiring, uh, natural surges, uh, or using a BU power supply. So just keep that in mind. Right beside that, we have our ZAMP solar plug here. Now this is a direct connection to the battery. This will allow you to take advantage of any portable solar panel. Uh, that is going to plug directly there uh, and essentially be plug and play. So with all of those kind of portable panels, the charge controller is built directly into the panel so you don't have to worry about um, you know, the maintenance side of things. It's going to plug directly in. You're gonna directionalize your panel and it's kind of like a set and forget thing. Directly below that, we have a standard RG6 cable fitting. It's just going to be a pass-through cable connection to the designated TV area of the camper. That would allow you to feed either an aftermarket satellite package or a park cable service to the unit. And then right beside that, we have our water uh, inlets. Uh, the first one up on the uh, left there is going to be our potable water. That's how we're going to fill that onboard water tank. We are going to stick our drinking water hose directly into that orifice. We're going to fill it up until we are satisfied. Once we've done so, we of course cap it off. Now this tank is not naturally pressurized. Of course, you're gonna use the onboard water pump uh, to pressurize that system, draw it up to the fixtures and make that water usable. 
Uh, now, beside that, we have our city water connection. Now, city water is pressurized directly from the line. Uh, oftentimes, it's overpressurized for what these units are rated for. So these units are rated for a max working water pressure of it generally in between 50 and 75 PSI. Uh, with your purchase, we include a water pressure regulator. So it's very, very important that we do use this. This specific water pressure regulator is going to keep that pressure in between 40 and 50 PSI. Uh, when, it goes, when it does go to hook this up, we're going to hook this directly onto the water source or spigot. So that's going to be uh, the first thing we hook onto that spigot. We are then going to take our, fresh or our spigot side of our hose and hook directly onto that water pressure regulator. And then lastly, we will make our trailer bound connection uh, by rotating this side of things. So very easy to make that connection. Uh, again, can't stress enough how important it is to use a water pressure regulator, so make sure we're not using the unit for any amount of time uh, without regulating that pressure. Uh, next up is going to be our uh, six gallon capacity dual source water heater. So what it means when I say dual source is it not only runs on 110 volt electricity uh, for when you are in a RV park or again, you have access to uh, full time electricity, or it runs on propane with 12 volt direct spark ignition if you're kind of off grid, uh, taking advantage of that side of the unit. So uh, manufacturer has some pretty distinct recommendations on how you operate this, specifically when you drain it. Uh, from a safety standpoint, it's very important that we do things correctly. So number one, uh, when it does come to drain it, uh, and, and just for your knowledge, we're going to drain the water from not only the water heater, but from the unit as a whole, anytime it is going to be in storage for more than seven days. So uh, number one, we're going to let it cool down, make sure that it is at a working temperature, oftentimes take a lot longer than you may think. So once we are confident of the temperature, we are going to depressurize uh, the unit as a whole. So uh, first thing you're going to do is you're going to cut the inflow of water to the unit. If you are on the freshwater holding tank, it is just as easy as uh, physically turning off that water tank or that water pump. Excuse me. If we are on that city water connection, you're physically going to turn the uh, water off or the flow of water off at the valve. So once you've cut off the overall flow of water into the unit, you are going to go to the inside. You're going to find the hot side of any fixture, whether that's in the kitchen or the bathroom, whichever. Uh, you're going to open up that hot side of the fixture. You're going to see a little bit of pressure, a little bit of water uh, be relieved from that location. Once you've done so, you've actually depressurized the water heater and it's actually safe to drain. Uh, so from there, you're going to come outside here. You're going to get an inch and a 16th socket and generally an extension with that. And you're going to go ahead and back out your drain plug here. Uh, now, once you've done so, you're going to see the remaining five, five and a half gallons of water uh, be evacuated from this location. Uh, so once you've done that, you, the unit is ready for storage, you're good to go. Um, now when you've returned the unit back to storage, it's very important to prime uh, or feed the, the water heater six gallons of water before we actually start heating that water. So of course, number one, we're going to uh, go ahead and replace your anode rod and drain plug here. Uh, once you've done so, we are going to introduce water as a whole to the unit uh, or pressurize the system. You're going to do that again by, by either one of these hookups, turn that uh, water pump on or the water at the spigot. Uh, once you've done so, you're again going to go to the hot side of the fixture on the inside. You're going to turn that on. Now what you're going to see is slightly different. You're going to see number one, a lot more water come from the fixture, but also a lot more air. Uh, what it's doing is it's just displacing the air within the tank and replacing it with water. Generally, it takes about five minutes for you to work all that air out from the system. Once that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is your indicator that you do have six gallons of water in the, in the uh, water heater tank, and we can start heating that, whether that again be with the 110 volt heating element uh, or the propane with direct spark ignition. Now from here, uh, so far I've referred to this as your drain plug. It is in fact your drain plug, but it does kind of play double duty. It's also an anode rod. Uh, what an anode rod does is it acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. They deposit onto that anode rod and eat away at that as opposed to the inside of the water heater. Uh, it is a consumable part. Generally we see our customers get a year or two in between having to change their anode rod. It's gonna start out about three quarters of an inch by 12 inch. By the time it needs to be replaced, it's going to be about the size of a pencil and look very decrepit. So again, uh, make sure we're inspecting that uh, when we are removing that for draining. 
Uh, moving on here, of course, we have your storage compartment here. Nothing too crazy to speak of. You do have the magnetic hold opens, which is nice. Uh, and it is, of course, secured not only by a key, but with a latch as well. On the two rear corners of the unit, we have stabilizer jacks. Uh, what that's going to do is stabilize the floor. It keeps it from feeling like you're walking around on a couple tires. Uh, they will correspond with your stabilizer jack crank handle or a three quarter inch socket if you're inclined to use that. Uh, of course, we just put our crank handle on there and that will allow us to go ahead and start lowering that jack. Now, what we're going to do is we're gonna make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more. Uh, what we're trying to avoid is overly stressing these jacks. So they're not necessarily weight bearing. They are just designed as the name implies to stabilize the floor. So here at the rear of the unit, we're going to start right up front here. Uh, cool thing that Intech is doing with the 2021 models is they have now uh, pre-wired it for a backup camera. It makes adding that appliance or that feature very easy to do so. Uh, you're not really tied to any brand of camera. Uh, what they have done is they've just ran the wiring here. So uh, again, you can take advantage of uh, any camera you'd like. Uh, installation is going to be very easy. Remove the four screws there, uh, connect the wiring, of course, mount your camera, and you're going to be good to go. Uh, down here in the rear, uh, again, you have your taillights, uh, license plates, nothing too crazy there. Uh, we have your secondary receiver here. Uh, Excellent for, again, a, a cargo rack or a bike rack, whichever you prefer. Just keep in mind, as the sticker says here, 100 pound max capacity. So make sure we're not exceeding that. Now, if we get super low, uh, we can see our spare tire that is going to be mounted there on the underside of the camper. Um, one thing to note when you are changing a tire on this specific unit, we're going to put our jack directly on the axle as close to the tire as we can without it interfering in our work. We're going to come under here. We're going to uh, unscrew those uh, lug nuts that are holding that tire to the frame. Of course, change our tire and we'll be good to go. So my favorite thing here about these soles is this outside kitchen. Uh, now this hasn't changed uh, very much over the years. So if you've kind of seen this on the other models, it's, it's pretty much the same. Uh, has a little release button here. You're of course going to push that. Uh, that will allow this to come out. Now uh, we have our griddle cooktop here, uh, which is a, a, again, a really, really cool feature. Uh, now when it comes to utilizing this and lighting it, you're going to take advantage of the frame uh, mounted uh, auxiliary propane port, which is a quick connect port. So you have your hose here that, that stores uh, in that kind of uh, empty space there. Uh, so once you have that pulled out, you're going to go ahead and remove your dust cap there on the quick connect fitting. And once you've done so, you're going to go ahead and insert the male end fully. Uh, maybe easier for you if you slide that collar back. Now, once you've inserted that fully, that collar is going to spring back. And then we go ahead and open up the valve here. So with that being said, the propane is flowing up to the appliance. So we're going to come back here to the top side of the appliance. We would then remove the griddle uh, top. That's going to give us a better view uh, of the actual burner assembly. So once you've done so, uh, we will push in on this handle and it is as simple as holding that in that pushed in position, rotating it counterclockwise until we hear that click. And we would repeat that, of course, until this burner assembly lit up. Now, once it has lit up, we can go ahead and kind of pick where we want our flame to be in level of intensity. And once we're satisfied with it, we would take our griddle top and of course put that back. That would allow us to go ahead and prep our meal uh, from there. So another thing that I do really enjoy here about this outside kitchen area is going to be the uh, cooler system that they run or the refrigerator out here. Uh, now you're gonna have access to this, whether you're on or off grid, it is 12 volt uh, powered as well as 110 volt powered. Of course, you're going to remove the buckle uh, there and if we go ahead and take a look at this display, now it is backwards for us, uh, but still very easy to navigate. You have an on off button here, and then we have our temperature control here, and then we can go ahead and change kind of a few settings there uh, with this set button. So it's a single mode button. This also does have an app you can download on your phone so you can control temperatures and things like that uh, through the app. So very easy to use. Uh, does open from either direction, which is cool. Uh, and does have handles that you could put on there uh, if you were inclined to do so, although I don't believe it fits here in this 
uh, space with those handles installed. So before going down the road, make sure that we are rebuckling this in. You don't want that to shift uh, going down the road. One thing you'll want to remember to do is disconnect your propane line here, uh, something that I tend to forget myself. Uh, before doing so, we're going to go ahead and turn off the valve. Again, push that in. That's going to allow us to release that, and we're going to tuck that back up into its place. And then we are going to push the red release tab. And once we've done so, everything will feed back into its place. Make sure we push that in until we hear that click so we do actually know it is in that locked position. And then again, you have those magnetic hold opens that will allow that uh, to close down. Uh, also beside there, we have your sprayer hose. Uh, this is going to utilize that quick connect style connection as well. Uh, of course, we see it here in the hooked up position. You have a little uh, kind of generic hose sprayer uh, will work well. And again, we uh, unlock the, or we, we push that slide collar back. That's going to release. Then we can go ahead and take our hose and store it in that uh, same compartment. So everything is self-contained, uh, stores nicely. So with all of that out of the way, that kind of gives us better access to go ahead and demo the awning. Uh, what you have here is going to be your awning crank handle. It is a manual Thule crown awning, so just keep that in mind. We will uh, put this into the corresponding handle here, and then we will rotate that clockwise to go ahead and bring that awning out. Now we have that awning uh, rolled out as far as we can in our shop here. We have, of course, this other beautiful unit right next to us. Um, now it's an eight foot awning, so you have quite a bit more uh, room to run that out. But if, if you're inclined to run it out halfway or you're in a si uh, similar kind of uh, space restricted kind of setup, then, then you can run it out this far. Uh, now with that being said, we have our arms inside the awning uh, cover. So what you're going to do with those is you're going to use your thumb here. You're going to pivot that arm into the outward position that will allow you to kind of swing this down. Uh, once you've done so, you have a release tab here. You can go ahead and then, of course, come to the ground here. Uh, is included with a couple stakes to go ahead and stake that into the ground. And once you're satisfied with the position, you can even adjust the pitch of the awning as well. Uh, either way, once you are satisfied, you're going to push that into the upward position there. Uh, now you would of course do the same thing to the other side uh, and that's going to allow you to position the awning any way you like. Uh, when it does come to uh, putting it away, you are going to unlock the tab there. You're going to feed that up. Uh, make sure we push that down. And we're going to, very important that we put this foot again positioned towards the metal part of that covering. Once we've done so, that's going to allow us to come here and put that back in a stowed position. So just so you know, this awning is not designed to be uh, utilized unsupported. So if you have the awning out, uh, this, as we have it right now, is not an essentially an acceptable position. Uh, you will want to make sure you are supporting it with the, uh, with the legs. Uh, now, when you roll it back in, of course, you're going to go counterclockwise. It's going to bring it in. Now, this handle has a habit of locking into the, it's supposed to lock in both positions, but it seems to lock a lot better when you are uh, bringing it back in. So when it does lock into place, you're going to kind of push up on it, free that kind of from the gearing, and it can be tricky, but once you've done so, once you get it in that upwards position, you're going to rotate it half a turn. Uh, so it will actually come out of that and, and allow you to remove the handle. So also we're going to find a couple 110, 15 amp all weather outlets. That's going to allow you to uh, power any 110 volt appliances that you may be utilizing uh, while you're out, uh, enjoying this outdoor space. Uh, also we have our step uh, in the extended position, very easy to pull that in and out. Uh, it is a friction hold, so uh, there's no latches or anything. Uh, essentially, you just lift up. That will allow you to feed it in. Uh, and again, it locks into that inward position. Now, when we pull it out, we just give it a, a slight lift up and we pull it out. So very easy to use. Uh, also here on the exterior, we have a door hold back. Uh, what you're going to do is you are going to just open the door. It is magnetic as well. You're going to, you know, that's going to stay in position. That will allow you to uh, take advantage of your screen door here. So just about covers it here on the exterior of the Soul Horizon. 
we're going to hop on the inside and take a look at those features. So right here inside the entry door, we are going to find a very important piece of safety equipment. Uh, of course, it's your fire extinguisher. Now, not only with the fire extinguisher, but with all of your safety equipment, it is very important that we test that every single time we take the unit out. We want to make sure that it is in perfect working order, of course, before we uh, encounter any uh, emergencies. If you go ahead and push the green button, if it springs back, that means you still have life in it. If it stays pressed, then you want to go ahead and pull it out and replace it. Right above that fire extinguisher, we have our main light switch cluster. Uh, everything is clearly marked in terms of uh, function. So of course, we're not gonna spend too much time on that. Uh, you can of course read the corresponding switch to the uh, light that it controls. So right beside that switch cluster, we have our main GFCI plug. Um, all of the receptacles within this unit are on the same circuit. If one of them gets overloaded, they all kind of follow suit. You're gonna find a test and reset button on here. Uh, just for your knowledge, if you see this orange light, that means that they have been tripped and you're going to need to go ahead and reset it there on the uh, receptacle. So right above the entry door, we have another very important piece of safety equipment. It's going to be your smoke alarm as well as your carbon monoxide alarm uh, built into one unit. Now this runs on a nine volt battery, so make sure that we keep a spare in case we need to replace that out there on the road and does have a test button. Uh, and again, just to drive it home, we do wanna make sure we test all of our safety equipment every single time before we take the unit out. Uh, now transitioning here into the kind of the dinette area, uh, we're gonna go ahead and take a look here at the shades. Uh, this is going to use two-way shades. So of course, this is going to be your night mode. Uh, that's going to um, you know, block out most of the light. Uh, and then we have kind of a, a less opaque um, kind of uh, option there and then of course if we pull that up uh, we are all the way open now this unit for the most part is going to utilize these kind of school bus style windows you have a couple different windows throughout the unit but for this style uh, you have two spring taps here on both sides of the window we push those towards the inside uh, once it's fully open it's going to stay in that open position uh, now, when we go to make the dinette into a bed, uh, it's very easy to do so. Number one, you're going to separate the, uh, the, the tabletop from the pedestal. So next, we are going to unscrew the pole from the floor flange. Uh, very easy to do so. If it hasn't been screwed in too tight, uh, you're just going to rotate that counterclockwise. Um, you may feel that kind of shift in position. Now, uh, what's happening is we're essentially unscrewing this, which when you're installing the table, will tighten down into that floor flange and kind of keep things um, nice and tight. Now, when you're resetting this or resetting up the dinette, it, you're going to do yourselves a lot of favors and make it a lot easier if you go ahead and initially just back this all the way out before you even start to uh, put it into the flange. So with both of those out of the way, we're going to come up top here to the cabinetry. We can see our dinette cushion or bed cushion is going to be housed up there. We go ahead and remove it. What that will allow us to do is tuck this underneath the cushions. It's easier if you start here up front. And we're gonna work that towards the back. And there you go, uh, as easy as it gets to make this into a secondary sleeping area. Uh, when putting it away, of course, again, same thing in reverse. We're gonna get rid of that. We've already went and unscrewed this all the way out. We're going to line that up in the floor flange and begin to tighten it. Uh, now you don't really have to go crazy when you're tightening this down. It will only uh, make it harder for you when you go to remove it. And then again, a friction fit here on the tabletop. So we line that up and you may kind of find yourself uh, wiggling that into place. Also here in this kind of dinette area, we have these uh, little reading lights. They come on blue. If we hold them for a couple seconds longer, they turn to a bright, right, bright white, more usable light. Uh, we also have this pull down privacy shade here. Uh, so again, it's kind of like a projector style uh, where you just pull down and um, you know, that's going to block uh, that window. And then when we're done using that, we just give it a slight pull and that's gonna self feed all the way up. 
So right over here, we have your fuse panel breaker box. Now this is going to house not only your 12 volt appliances, uh, but your 110 volt as well. Uh, everything here we see on the right side is going to be uh, utilizing a replaceable automotive blade style fuse. Uh, definitely recommended that you keep some spares with the unit uh, as fate would have it. Uh, if you don't have a spare, you'll probably immediately need one. And then we have our 110 volt resettable breakers here. Same kind of variant you're going to find in your breaker box at home. In terms of function, everything is labeled here on the door uh, to, to point you in the right direction. Uh, right beside that, we have your battery disconnect switch. Now what that's going to do is isolate that battery from the rest of the 12 volt system. Uh, pretty much designed for periods of long-term storage. If you're going to be storing the unit, it's best to just, again, go ahead and isolate that battery by moving that into the off position. That's going to keep any nominal or phantom draws off of that battery, keep it in tip-top shape while in storage. Uh, right above that, uh, nothing too crazy, a couple 15 amp, 110-volt uh, receptacles. And then we have a 12-volt kind of charging session, uh, charging station a couple USBs, as well as a cigarette, light, cigarette lighter style 12 volt receptacle. So here we have your high point microwave oven. Uh, not too terribly much that differentiates this from any other uh, microwave you've probably used. Uh, turn stable, turntable style microwave, um, time and temperature settings at their traditional locations. Again, very kind of straightforward, very easy to use. Uh, dropping down, or we're going to take a look here at your Jensen stereo unit. Uh, again, pretty basic in terms of operation. You have your, all of your different modes here outlined at the top uh, with a button. And then down below, we have our presets. We have a couple other options down here at the very bottom. Our power switch is going to be here. We have different zones, A and B. Uh, for this particular unit, we're only going to utilize zone A. And then, of course, we have your sync find, play pause, and enter with your volume control there. And then right below that, we have your Dometic three-way fridge. Uh, this fridge runs on 110 volt electricity, as well as propane gas and 12 volt as well. Uh, you, of course, push the button with the corresponding source, and that's going to take it right into that mode. We have our temperature control here. The higher or more bars you see, the uh, colder the unit's going to run. And then this little triangle with an exclamation point it's just a, a kind of a code exception button. If you have any indicators as, as this not working properly, like say it didn't light on propane uh, or you don't have access to 110 volt electricity, it's smart enough to let you know and then it's gonna beep at you and this is just acknowledging that there is an issue and that, that you are working to correct it. Uh, opening it up, uh, again, nothing too crazy to speak of there. Uh, you have those cool blue lights, but uh, also has that removable ice box. Uh, directions to go ahead and move, remove that ice box and take advantage of that extra space is outlined right there on that sticker. And then if we come here and we position this little clip into the outward position, that's going to keep that door from closing. That's specifically designed for periods of storage, so it's not going to get uh, kind of mildewy there on the inside. So a couple cool features there with the refrigerator. If we hop up here to your command control, now this is going to not only give us a real-time readout of where our tanks sit and level of full, but it's also going to give us control to your water pump, your freshwater tank heater or your tank heaters. Uh, what that's going to do is if you are uh, camping in cold weather, it's going to keep those tanks from freezing. And then we have our water heater sources here, gas and electric. Now, I didn't mention this there on the exterior of the unit. Uh, but you can go ahead and use both sources at the same time if they are available. That is actually going to give you the highest recharge rate. Uh, next up is going to be standalone gas. And then lastly, in terms of efficiency, is going to be electric. Uh, now, if we are backing up here to the gas side of things, uh, if this gas side of, of the water heater were to uh, go through its lighting cycle and not, end by the, and not light by the end of its lighting cycle, it's going to go ahead and illuminate this DSI fault light. Uh, in the event that happens, that, is just, that just means that it did not light. Either generally you are out of propane gas or the propane hasn't made its way through the line to the appliance. Uh, if, you're, if you see that DSI fault light, just go outside, check and make sure that you have gas in the tank, make sure the valve's open, and then turn the switch in the off position, turn it back on, and that water heater will start to cycle again. Here we are in the kitchen area. Um, 
First up is going to be our Dometic uh, cast iron top stove. Uh, very kind of basic in operation, uh, just like any kind of Coleman camping stove or, or, you know, if you have any experience in these kind of cooktops, they all basically work the same. Uh, what we're going to do is turn the off button into that light position. And from there, we just hit the, um, the piezo electric igniter here. Uh, of course, I don't think we have propane turned on this unit specifically, but if we did, you'd see the flame uh, with that corresponding burner. Of course, just a standard two burner stove. Uh, when it does come to close the lid, this has a locking mechanism built in. You're gonna wanna make sure you lift up and then close the lid down there. Uh, of course, before doing so, you want to give it ample time to cool down. If you've been, been running that burner for a long time, make sure you let that cast iron cool down before you go ahead and close the lid. And then you're also going to find your large uh, single bay sink uh, with your kind of farmhouse sprayer here. Um, in terms of function, very basic, of course, just like any other kind of uh, sink you've ever used. Now, there is a countertop extender uh, to go with this. And here we're going to find that in the... Um, cabinet and if you don't drop it uh, very easily just kind of sits over top of that and allows you to go ahead and, and use this space more efficiently if you're like prepping a meal uh, or anything you you know you you have limited counter space uh, this effectively doubles that when this is in place so here we have your Dometic toilet uh, this particular model has a uh, porcelain bowl, which is a nice feature. Now it is also going to utilize a pedal style flush. It will be a light press to fill that toilet up with water and then a full press to actually flush the toilet. Uh, very important that we do talk about chemical treatments and toilet paper usage, things like that. Uh, number one, we're gonna use a single ply RV toilet paper here with this unit and, and really any RV for that matter. Uh, you should be using a deodorizing chemical treatment. Uh, something to break down that tissue, whether that be an enzymatic or a chemical product. Either way, all of those products are going to be introduced here right from the toilet. So follow the instructions on the specific product you're using. And then again, go ahead and introduce it from this location. Uh, other than that, we have our light switch here for the overhead light right inside the door or right behind the toilet. And then we have our uh, shower head here. Uh, you do have a multi-positional arm here. So if you're super short or super tall, it should accommodate you either way. Uh, different kind of spray modes on that head as well as an on-off switch uh, to help you conserve water consumption. So right above my head here, we have your vent fan. This is designed to draw out any moisture uh, from the area, spe specifically while you're showering. Uh, you just crank it into the upward position. You have a push button here to actually turn on that exhaust fan. Uh, most importantly with this is when you are done using it, uh, before uh, going down the road, you do want to make sure that you do uh, crank that all the way down and kind of snug it up. That's going to keep that from flapping open or getting uh, torn off going down the road. Here uh, in the bed area, we have your uh, Dometic Captive Touch thermostat here. Uh, now, just as the name implies, this is actually kind of like a touch screen. There's no physical buttons. We hit that mode button. Uh, that kind of wakes it up and then first up we need to choose a fan speed and we're talking about air conditioner fan speed our high our options are high low and auto if we go to either high or low that fan is going to run indefinitely uh, no matter what we actually set the thermostat on so to keep it right with us we're going to go ahead and put it in uh, auto mode and then i hit that one more time that's going to take us into that main air conditioner mode uh, what it's saying is the thermostat set at 56 degrees. We are in that auto fan speed and then we are in air conditioner mode here. So we're going to, if we push that button one more time, that's going to take us there into that furnace mode. Uh, what it's going to do is once it kind of realizes what's going on, it's going to power down that air conditioner and blower mode. And what we're seeing here is that it's 72 degrees. We are still in that auto fan speed and we are now in heat. Uh, now what it's going to do is it's going to power that blower motor on immediately 16 seconds after that it's actually going to ignite uh, by that 30 second mark it's going to start producing noticeable heat uh, in a unit of this size uh, don't be alarmed if again probably about that minute and a half two minute mark uh, it actually sets off the smoke alarm uh, now that it is in the manufacturer's uh, specifications that that may happen what's happening is of course when you're going down the road things like that uh, you have quite a bit of dust and debris that's depositing onto the 
uh, furnace itself and what you're seeing there is it is it kind of burning off in that initial operation so not something to be alarmed about uh, not something you have to worry about and then lastly we go ahead into that off position that's going to go ahead and power everything down uh, now beside that we have our max X, or max fan or max air control uh, what we have here is going to be an on off button uh, that's going to actually control our speeds too we have four speeds this is a an exhaust only fan. So the idea being is that you would open up these windows, uh, you'd get a nice cross breeze going. You can actually close that vent, run that fan to circulate air within the camper. And then of course we have our off button there. So very easy to use. Uh, next up is going to be our television unit here. If we see this black piece of ribbon here, if we went ahead and pulled that, uh, that's actually going to unlock that TV and allow us to kind of position that throughout the camper if we we're taking advantage of the couch space on the other side uh, or you know really wherever. Uh, big thing is is when we go to return that unit we want to make sure that it does lock there into place that's going to keep that from kind of vibrating loose going down the road. Uh, of course above that we get a couple speakers, a battery operated clock, uh, nothing too crazy with that. Last but not least here in the bed area we're going to find a couple USB chargers uh, same variant that we found throughout the camper. We have a couple 110 volt receptacles. Again, same variant we found throughout. We have a bedroom light switch here. Um, that's just going to turn the overhead lights. Again, we have those same style reading lights again that we've seen throughout the camper. Uh, hold that down for a couple seconds, turns to a bright white. And then lastly, we have a very important uh, safety feature here is going to be your emergency exit. Now, if your entry door becomes blocked and you do need to exit, the unit you can do it from this location you have a little plastic handle here if we go ahead and rotate that out uh, that will allow you to actually push that window full out like a doggy door you're of course going to use this handle to remove the screen first uh, it does kind of hold up into that position there to allow you to use that as a normal window so that just about covers it here on the 2021 Soul Horizon uh, we hope we covered everything. If there's something that we missed, please don't hesitate to give us a call or a comment below. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this presentation. Thank you so much for your time.